I get arrested, I get sentenced to seven years uh, imprisonment. They were aware in the, from the newspapers as, as to what I was charged with, which was uh, 16 acts of uh, terrorism. And really the ANC and the underground Communist Party and so on had been badly smashed. I started writing poetry uh, as an adolescent, like many adolescents, dealing with uh, confused rom romantic aspirations, falling in love hopelessly and uselessly, and so on. And the poetry wasn't very good, but I, I was fascinated by poetry as, as a sort of high school student. Uh, that would have been in the late, in the, in the sort of mid 1960s early 1960s and mid-1960s. I went to the University of Cape Town and became politicised. I hadn't been political at all. I didn't adopt a political attitude, it was just a, a kind of moral, moral perspective. And then in my first year I became politically active and in fact joined the underground of the South African Communist Party. So then my poetry, I, I wasn't writing poetry, I was involved in, in sort of politics. Um, and it was only really when I was arrested, I rediscovered both the need, but also the possibilities of, 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 of a poetic voice. I wasn't embarrassed about going to jail, I was proud of going to jail. Not so proud that I'd got caught by the security police, I'd, I'd worked hard not to be, but I got caught. When I arrived there, the other comrades, the other white male uh, political prisoners said to me, What sentence he'd got? And I said, seven years. And I said, that was a parking ticket. You'll be here long enough just to dirty the dishes. It was a bit naughty, I suppose, because we'd already been there more than seven years. And I suppose really in a joking way, I was trying to say, you'll get through it easily. And then the one, Dennis Goldberg, who was arrested at Rivonia, was part of the Rivonia trial, along with Nelson Mandela and others. Because I had four life sentences, and for the white criminal prisoners, that meant I was a hell of a guy with four life sentences. One of the second questions was, was did you, you didn't expect to get arrested? And I said to them, a bit cheekily, um, I thought you were going to, but I was working very hard to make sure that you didn't. Uh, so I got a good clap for being cheeky. Solitary confinement is all about depriving you of a sense of who you are, of making you completely vulnerable. Political prisoners, when they uh, get to prison in those days, you'd get a handbook which tells you all the things you can't do. And clause, I forgot, forget which, but 32 or something like that, it said it's forbidden to sing, uh, to shout, uh, to write poetry. We, we had writing material because we were by that stage allowed to study. We were allowed to do UNISA courses, for instance, by correspondence. I was suddenly called from the woodwork shop and told I had a special visit, uh, you know, a special basuk. Uh, but be warned, you know, if uh, Politics is discussed, we'll stop it immediately. And so I wasn't sure what the special visit was at all about. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I arrived in the visiting room, and the visiting rooms are a bit like the ones you see in the movies. Um, it was like a, a kind of round glass, like a, like a porthole in a ship. Thick glass and a microphone on either side. Um, and a warder standing behind your visitor and a warder standing behind you, so that watching to see if you're making secret signs or whatever communicating secretly to each other. The visitors being taped, of course, as well while you're there. Um, and they stop the visit if they think that you, you, you're communicating something that they don't like you to communicate. So now I arrive in the visiting room and there's my mother-in-law. Uh, and I can see that something shocking has happened. And she tells me that uh, my wife had died suddenly of a brain tumor. She'd come to tell me that, and she was told that, uh, 
that's all she could tell me, and she was allowed, I think, 10 or 15 minutes. And of course, she was weeping. The horrible thing is I couldn't, she couldn't comfort me, and I couldn't comfort her, because we were separated by this, this glass window and the walls. Um, so it was, it was one of the more difficult, most difficult for me, uh, experience while I was in prison. This outgoing but reserved young man suddenly became frozen, white-faced, pale, wandering around in a dream. And one day I said to him, Jeremy, I'm worried about you. I see you're frozen inside yourself. And you know, one of the responses to the death of somebody you love is to be angry with them. Why did they leave you behind? The other is to be angry with yourself because you can't cry, you can't weep. You, you feel that you're not a human being because you're not feeling enough. He felt he was not a person worth leaving alive because he could not feel and he could not cry. And he wanted to commit suicide out of despair about himself because he couldn't mourn enough. bearing their own burdens, of course. So I also felt that I couldn't overburden myself on them, but, but nonetheless, the, the comrades there with their own challenges were incredibly supportive, and there was tremendous solidarity through, through that period. But at the same time, uh, I had also to discipline myself in my sorrow and bereavement. But in that period, he wrote some of the most beautiful love poetry I've ever heard. I saw your mother with two guards, through a glass plate for one quarter of an hour on the day that you died. Extra visit, special visit, I was told and warned. The visit will be stopped if politics is discussed. Verstaan, understand, on the day that you died. I couldn't place my arms around her, around your mother, when she sobbed. Fifteen minutes up, I was led back to the workshop your death, your death, my wife, my wife. One, one crime they managed, they managed not, not to perpetrate on the day that you died. And for him, that was the catharsis, the release that he needed. About halfway through the sentence, there was a, a very brave and uh, uh, brilliant escape by some of my comrades. They managed to get out of Pretoria maximum security prison. And so as a result of that, th those of us who remained behind were shifted uh, to another part of the Pretoria maximum security complex. And we were shifted into what was called Beverly Hills, ironically by the, it was up on the Skanskop hillside. And that was the hanging prison. It was normally on a Wednesday morning, uh, that the hangings would, 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 would happen. And um, we would know that there was going to be hangings the next morning on a Tuesday evening, uh, because the, every, every evening there would be singing coming from B section and A section. Um, and it was, as you, as you might imagine, people psyching themselves out and just giving themselves strength, as African people do, through, through song. It was mainly hymns and sad songs. And then these comrades who were waiting to be hanged would sing, long live the ANC, long live. We shall never forget you, long live the ANC. And what it said to me was that here were comrades who knew why they were in the struggle that they were prepared to offer their lives for this goal of freedom. And they did it consciously and willingly. And we would hear them coming down the long passage, too short for them, but long passage, 
in leg irons shuffling along, we would hear the sound. And then a few minutes later, we would hear that sort of sound. Because there were multiple uh, trap doors and multiple hangings very often. And we would know another two, three, four people had been, had been hanged, literally 20 meters away from where we were confined. Perhaps I didn't hear. Of course, we never get to speak to each other as such. We're still 50 yards, one corridor, many locked locks apart. We try singing at night, us down here to you three condemned along there. Morena, we whiteys sing, Maibui Africa, and muffled far off chortling, you guys call back, encore. Then it's you singing, slow antiphonal phrases, three tongues floating over that audible drop which gathers the words thrumming in your throats, brothers, about which some Wednesday morning three nooses will go. One voice leading, arise, high up. Every night, Every deeper, night. two in the chorus, chorus. Prisoners, prisoners from your slumbers, from slumbers. called and to boil or respond or like a ripple, like a lurch, like a uku chlabalela, is to glow like a, growl like a, glow like a, boil like a, bean stew like a, ripple like a, buskew, weaves like a, moves like a, stalks like a, moves like a, fighter, uku chlabalela, three voices called or moize, combine or responding, tsutsobi, weaving shabangu, in and voices each other around of sliding into each night's Finale, Finale, all three, three now is one. The internationally unites the human race. Aman, long live, long live, Mandela, Tambo, Sisulu, long live, long live, shouted, long live. Your voices, brothers, down these concrete corridors of power. I was able to, in, in a variety of ways like this, uh, sm smuggle virtually all of the poems out. I did my best to, to memorise them just in case they didn't get out. Later, I wrote his poetry on cigarette papers. They call it zigzags in prison. You know those cigarette rizzlers? Well, it's very fine paper. And so you can write so tiny that you can't read it without a magnifying glass. Uh, where did I learn? Nobody told me. It just seemed sensible. And also, you see, because it's so thin, it doesn't take up very much space when you can find a little pocket somewhere to hide it. I showed him how to do it and, and then hid them for him and he could take them out. So when I was in prison, a lot of the poems are trying to build a sense of a common South Africa, a common place. Uh, uh, that's why a lot of the poems try to mix up languages. Uh, to be, they're mainly English poems, of course, but multilingual in, in character and in feel, multicultural in feel, and to try to, 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 to get a sense of that, that unity and common purpose. One of the funniest things was that he published his book of poetry, Inside, called Inside, shortly after he was released. And the critic said, that's amazing to remember that poetry. And one of them even said, he must have remembered it. And you can hear in the rhythm of the poetry, him walking up and down in the small cell and the language, the rhythm of the language matching his footsteps because he had to memorize it. And Jeremy couldn't say, sorry, it was written on cigarette. Paper. So most of them got out in a written form and I managed to recover them once I was out of prison. Some of the poems didn't work because they were more contemplative. Others were more oral in character. Some probably just got lost, but um, the, the, the book is, is what came out or what was recoverable from prison. You know, I considered myself um, just one of tens of thousands of political prisoners in South Africa at the time. What I admire Jeremy for is that having come out of prison, he went into exile, he became active again there, but the moment he could get back home, he did come back home, as you know, of course, he's Deputy General Secretary of the Communist Party, but he's also a Deputy Minister of Transport, a highly technical ministry, and he's mastered it. 
think I'm more of an intellectual and a politician and a poet than, 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 than a politician in the strict sense of it. South Africa is a society full of many contradictions uh, and illusions and trying to use poetry to, to puncture the illusions. Moto ke moto kabato babang, which means in Sutu, a person is a person because of other people. By holding my mirror out of the window, I can see clear to the end of the passage. There's a person down there, a prisoner polishing a door handle. In the mirror, I see him see my face in the mirror. I see the fingertips of his free hand bunched together as if to make an object the size of a badge which travels up to his forehead, the place of an imaginary cap. This means a warder. Two fingers are extended in a V and wiggle like two antennae. He's being watched. A finger of his free hand makes a watch hand's arc on the wrist of his polishing arm without disrupting the slow, slow rhythm of his work. Later, maybe later we can speak. Hey, hey Papa Keda! A voice from around the corner. No, just no, polishing bars. He turns his back on me. Now watch. His free hand, the talkative one, slips quietly behind. Strength, brother, it says. In my mirror, a black fist. <laughs>